Cause I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, His life is destiny And all praise to God the Father And all praise to Christ the Son and all praise to the Holy Spirit, and our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. And I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine, ears and fertile eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rose a roaring light. And all praise to God the Father. And all praise to Christ the Son. And all praise to the Holy Spirit. And our God has overcome. And the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. And no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away? From the one who saved my life. And no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? And no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? And all praise to God the Father, and all praise to Christ the Son, and all praise to the Holy Spirit, and our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. And I believe, I believe. Zach. Good morning. <laughs> All right, Isaiah, good to have you up here with me. Um, good morning. Welcome to Broadway Baptist Church. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Come here, son. Right there. It's good to be here this morning uh, to worship together. Um, 
And so, yeah, thank you. A little caught off guard here. Um, but yeah, welcome to everyone. Welcome to uh, any guests who are here. We're so glad that you're here uh, to worship with us. And uh, this morning, I'm going to call us to scripture, or call us to worship through the reading of scripture. I'm going to read Psalm uh, 25, verses 1 through 10, and then we will pray and continue with worship. Uh, Psalm 25, verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble in his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, God. Lord, may we love your word above all else, uh, knowing that you instruct us and lead us on the path of righteousness, God. Lord, we pray that uh, we will continue on the path you have called us to. Uh, Lord, knowing your kindness and how you remove our sins and how you forget our sins when we trust in you, God. Uh, Lord, I pray that this morning our hearts will be prepared to worship you Uh, to seek after you, and to conform uh, to the image of your Son. Lord, I pray for the service, Lord, as Beecher continues in song leading us, and as Daniel uh, preaches the word, uh, may we be prepared to worship you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together. We're going to sing House of the Lord and talk about there's joy in this house this morning. We have so many things to be happy about and thankful for. Let's express that this morning in our worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. As he opened the prison doors, depart in the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Dark God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. As he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave, my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. And we were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. 
Let the house of the Lord sing parade. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out this morning. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice to the same old lies, if you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life, there's a better life, oh, if you've got pain, he's a pain taker, if you feel lost, he's a way maker, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior, if you've got chains, He's a chain breaker. And we've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. And we've all run to things we know just stay right. But there's a better light. Yeah, there's a better life, oh, if you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains. He's a chain breaker. 
If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. Amen. You all can be seated. Let's take up our offering this morning. <coughs> Allergies are not being kind to me. They haven't been kind to my whole family the last week, but they're not being kind to me today. <clears throat> so let's pray together <coughs> as we take up our offering. God, we thank you so much that uh, we have a chance to worship you. We have a chance to give uh, and worship through doing that. We know that uh, whatever funds that we take up uh, will be given to, to do the great programs that we have here at our church uh, to sustain our church and also to give the, to the community around us. So we just ask that uh, you bless the giver and bless the, the funds that are taken up to be used in your name. We thank you for a chance to worship again and a chance to hear the word this morning uh, when Pastor Daniel comes. In Jesus' name, amen. the sounds of your voice as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you So alive, I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys your soul.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that uh, you died for all of us. You died to save us, and it was your love that, that covers us from sin so we can one day join you in heaven. We thank you so much for uh, just a chance again to, to come here and worship you openly, uh, the chance to hear the word from Pastor Daniel. We pray for him as he comes this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Beecher. Zach, is this your Bible? Is this Zach's Bible? He ran away so fast with uh, Isaiah, he forgot it. So, oh, there you go, Beth. Look at that. <laughs> so, I wanted to, before our children, <clears throat> Mindy, you're teaching children's church, right? I want to tell our children about this coming week uh, because it's uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night. So, I want the parents to hear too and the children. This coming Wednesday night is a big event for the children's ministry. Wednesdays, you know, our church lives in what I call the Sunday-Wednesday routine. So like every Sunday you come to church and every Wednesday you come to church. But this Wednesday is really good. So basically our church on Wednesdays, from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., we have something going on truly for all ages. So like this coming week, I want you all to know. So 5.30 you show up and you can eat dinner. We serve, you know, we have dinner in the fellowship hall, and if you're a college student, you never pay. And if you're a first-time guest, you never pay. So if you could eat, if you're in college for four years or longer, you could eat here every Wednesday night for free. And, like, that would save you thousands of dollars. So uh, our food's really good, so you can show up at 530, 
And if you can't get here at 5, you can still show up like 6 and still eat. But um, and then at 6 o'clock, we have youth group, and Zach serves pizza down there in the youth. So we have two different dinners. Then this coming Wednesday at 6 o'clock, the back parking lot is going to be closed because we've got, we always do this back to school bash, and we've got these water slides so the children need to wear a swimsuit if they want to wear a swimsuit. You don't have to wear a swimsuit. And then we have a, a petting zoo. That's what Sarah has, a lady with a petting zoo coming. And we have hot dogs. And Minnie's going to be cooking hot dogs. And then at 6.30, you know, we have a college class now that meets on Wednesday nights. I'm going through the Gospel of Luke. That's my class that meets down in the fellowship hall. We have a women's class that meets right over here. We also have a choir practice so, I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of different groups you can be a part of on Wednesday, along with your regular youth groups. So, that will be this Wednesday from basically 5.30 to 7.30. There's something for you and your family, but especially this week, it will be really good with the back-to-school bash. Remember, if you're coming, you're not going to be able to park back here because we closed the back parking lot because we have children running around with swimsuits on. So, you park on the sides and just walk around this coming week. So that is this this coming week here at Broadway on Wednesday night. That's August 28th. All right, Miss Mindy, will you stand up over under? All right, if you're a little person and you're excited about the back to school bash and you want to go to Children's Church, you will stand up at this time and follow Miss Mindy downstairs to Children's Church. So we're going to Children's Church. John King's going to Children's Church. So, yep, all ages can go to Children's Church. Any other children? So parents, you will pick your children up downstairs over there when it's over with that. We want to open up our Bibles here to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. We are coming to a close. We've been going through the book of Acts uh, the past two months. And we're going to look here at this story about a man uh, named uh, Cornelius and Peter. Now, next week we're going to wrap this up. And, um, and it's about really Peter's big fall and his downfall that he made. But I'm going to give you all background information. So you're in your Bible, you're in the book of Acts chapter 10. And if you have your bulletin, you can reference it. The whole goal of this is to see how God took this man named Peter, who really started Acts, when he started in Acts chapter 1, he had just been restored, he really hasn't taken a leadership role And the Lord really used him mightily on three different occasions in basically three great revivals of the Lord. One was the Jewish Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The next is going to be when the Holy Spirit came down, what a lot of people call the Samaritan Pentecost in Acts chapter 8. And then what we're about to see here in Acts chapter 10 is the Gentile Pentecost. That's the mighty move of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter chapter 10 with Cornelius getting saved. Now, in church history, a lot of people say Cornelius, this was the first Gentile Christian. But as you read our Bibles, that might not be entirely true because uh, you can actually see people, I actually put them here in the bulletin, of some other people. In fact, the first Gentile who got saved likely was led to Christ by Jesus. And, uh, you know, he certainly led some people to himself, many people to himself, still does so today, but there was a Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 who Jesus said had great faith and was very impressed with how wonderful the man's faith was. A Canaanite woman, uh, she was not not Jewish at all, she was a Canaanite. Uh, Jesus says her faith was greatest faith he had ever found anywhere in Israel, and she was a Gentile. And then when Jesus died on the cross, There was a centurion there at the cross, and he said, surely this man must be the Son of God. Jesus' death and his crucifixion was so powerful, the guard was even impacted by what, what Jesus did on the cross. So very likely, those three people all got saved, and they became believers in Jesus because they witnessed what Jesus did directly. But in Acts chapter 8, just two chapters before Acts chapter 10, uh, there was a man... Named a, a deacon named Philip who was an evangelist and he was preaching in an area of Gaza. You ever hear about, ever hear about Gaza on the news? It was, Gaza's in the Bible and the uh, same area there, right there, that little patch of land between 
Israel, it's in southern Israel, in Egypt. And he was uh, riding a chariot, and he was an Ethiopian, and he was a eunuch, and he served the queen, and he was riding along, headed to Jerusalem. And the Bible says, told, by God told Philip to go up and uh, speak to that man. So he walked up, Philip did, and he heard the man reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Back in Bible times, they read scrolls. And then Philip says, do you, do you understand what you're reading? Just some stranger just walks up and says, this is how the Holy Spirit works in your life. He says, I have no idea what I'm talking about. How am I supposed to know? And then he began to explain the Scriptures starting in Isaiah and led him to Jesus. And the man got saved, that Ethiopian eunuch. And he actually got baptized right there in Gaza. Uh, and then he became a believer. And he was not a... Um, a, a he was not... He was a Gentile. He wasn't a, a, a Jewish man. So we see that there were likely other Gentiles that had actually gotten saved before Cornelius. But what happens, the reason why we give credit so much to Cornelius, and this passage we're about to see in our Bibles, is because Cornelius is when the Holy Spirit came down and did a great move to all of these uh, Gentiles. And there were so, two social barriers that Peter is going to have to break. And I'm going to tell you all what they are before we read this. Peter was very Jewish, which meant he followed the Old Testament. He followed kosher laws. In the book of Leviticus, it teaches about what types of food that Jewish people should not be eating. And if you go to Kroger and you pick up some food and it has a little K with a circle around it, that means it's kosher. That means if you're Jewish, you're eligible to eat that food. That meets the qualifications. So some of the types of food they would not eat would be like birds, uh, four-cloved animals, reptiles. Jewish people wouldn't uh, uh, pork. They would not eat that. So Jews would not eat this type of food. And they, a lot of them still don't eat it today. And what, what happens is Peter here, he would never break those kosher laws. He followed those uh, dietary laws to the, to the T. So this would be like, if you're like on the keto diet, all of a sudden, someone coming up to you offering you french fries, that would not qualify whatsoever for the keto diet, eating french fries from McDonald's. So like that would be very offensive, especially if the other person knew you're eating keto, you're on the keto diet, and then here they are giving you fries. You're like, what is this? Why aren't you even offering this to me? I don't eat this. This stuff's not, it's not good to eat, uh, or at least not good for that diet. It might be great to taste good, but it's not, it doesn't meet the thing. So understand, that's what Peter lived with. He lived with this Jewish unclean versus clean diet. And the second thing that he's dealing with in this passage is he was Jewish, and Cornelius is what we call a Gentile. If you're a Jew, you do not go into the house of a Gentile. In Bible times, if you entered into somebody's house, if they welcomed you into their home, that meant they accepted who you were. So a Jewish person would not, never allow a Gentile into their home. In fact, they wouldn't even go into the courtyard. So like, if you were going to go talk, like most of us, if we go and go, go visit somebody, we walk all the way up to the porch and, and push the ring doorbell. Back in Bible times, if you're Jewish and you're going to visit a Gentile, you would stand on their sidewalk and yell at them and hope they hear you and try to get their attention. You wouldn't walk up to their house because that means you're accepting them. And you certainly wouldn't go inside the house. So Jews and Gentiles would not do that. Now, a Gentile he would be very aware that he's not welcome into a Jewish house, although he doesn't view it as unclean if he were to walk in. He doesn't. Gentile wouldn't even care. But a Jewish person would find that uh, offensive or unclean or uncommon to do something like that. So God is going to deal with Peter on these two issues. And the goal of this message is really to see, are you relying upon yourself instead of God? Is there areas of your life, and I believe what we're going to see, God is going to point out to Peter. says, Peter, I want you to obey me and listen to what I say, because God is going to correct Peter upon this, uh, in, in this, in this uh, story here. And we want to make sure in our spiritual lives, we don't find ourselves uh, thinking we're, we're doing what's best, 
but really we're not following the Lord at all. And we just uh, find ourselves mistaken. And it, it's very easy, easy to do that. For example, yesterday I was in Paris, Kentucky at a cross-country meet uh, for uh, Benjamin. And we were there. And you know, when you see people you haven't seen in like a year or two, you know, you maybe try to speak to them, especially if you recognize them first. So, and I know this has had to happen to some else. So you go to these cross-country meets. There's like a thousand people. It's just packed. People everywhere. And you see kids running around. It's just like, wow, this is out of control. So you're th- I'm standing there, and I see this guy over, over yonder. And you know, there's still a lot of people around. There's people behind me, because people behind me is an important part of this story. And this is where I'm mistaken. And I see him over there, I recognize, I say, gosh, I haven't seen him in a while. I see Al Koran, he's, he's waving at me, or at least I thought it was at me. I go, oh, hey! <laughs> so I'm waving at him, and then I, I was reading his lips, because there's still like 50 feet between us. And I, he's, I thought he said, how are you? I said, I'm doing great, how are you doing? And then he made a comment, and then I like asked a question, like, it's good to see you. And then I noticed as I was talking, he didn't, he's like talking in the middle of my sentence. Like I, he didn't wait for me to finish. He keeps talking. And then he starts making this gesture that didn't really fit our conversation. I realized uh, there's somebody behind me that he's talking to. And I turn around. There's another guy there that he actually is talking to. And then you saw one of those things where you just, after you do that, you quickly put your head down and you realize that, that, wasn't on video, it didn't happen. We're just going to pretend that event didn't happen. I'm talking to a man who I thought was talking to me, but he's not talking to me. He's talking to the guy behind me. I'm just going to pretend like I don't know him anymore and I've never talked to him again. Those type of things do occur in our life. And what happens, you're relying upon, you know, that, that was for me, that was my conversation. When you find out, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't. Um, and I think what we're about to see in this story, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is locked in on his Jewish identity, and God is about to show him a vision and completely break up that foundation. And God is going to teach us this morning, maybe some of us, maybe some of you grew up as, and you still are, devout Southern Baptists. You believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, which is true, the Bible is inerrant. Once you start, once you no longer believe in the, I actually point if you, I don't know if somebody can actually get saved and not believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. Here's why: How can you believe there's errors in the Bible yet you trust Jesus for your salvation? You believe in the cross that He died. You're trusting your whole life with that, yet you also believe there's mistakes in the Bible. You either believe in all of what the Lord has told us here in Scripture, or you just you don't, you, you don't believe it. And then anything goes at that point. So you believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, you believe in believer's baptism, that we're saved and then we get baptized as believers. We believe that the Lord's Supper is what we do in obedience of Jesus. Lord's Supper doesn't save us. Baptism doesn't save us. Those are obser- uh, things we observe in obedience to Jesus because He told us to do that. Other thing we see here is maybe, uh, maybe not so much this verse. You go to the first verse, we sing out the Baptist hymnal. Uh, you are very used to supporting Baptist missions. You go to a Baptist school. Uh, you are, have this, you understand what uh, the, the culture is like in being one form of a denomination I mean, you might even use the Christian Standard Bible, which is what I'm using right now, which is actually the Baptist Bible, made by Lifeway, which is, they print the material for Southern Baptists. So you're you're trapped in this identity where this is what you know. And you think it's the right way. And of all those things there, what's truly the right way is the inerrancy of Scripture. That's the most important thing. Because we're foundation, we're based on the Word of God. But then all of a sudden, God brings someone in your life, a very unexpected person that you would not associate with, and God is going to change everything about your thinking. So let me illustrate this in my case. I uh, would, 
let's just say I checked at 2.30 this afternoon. The doorbell rings. And I go to the door. And there's three ladies, African American ladies there. One has blue hair, one has yellow hair, and green hair. And they claim they're lesbians, and they uh, are out campaigning to, be, to vote Democrat, and their whole value system probably is exactly the opposite of mine. What they believe, what they think, what their lifestyle, everything about these three ladies. We probably have very little in common except we have the most important thing in common. Us four at that door need Jesus. All four of us at that door, when I checked at 2.30, have a common need to be saved by Jesus. Now, we all approach the cross from different backgrounds, totally different worldviews. They're polar opposite probably of me. Folks, that's what we're about to see here in the Bible. We're about to see a man who's going to meet another man and they are just different as night and day. And the Lord is going to break Peter and show him, says, Peter, you can't, the barriers are about to come down. All that matters is Jesus. So that's where we're at here in the Bible. We're about to see two visions. I want you to follow along here. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a man in Caesarea... Now, Caesarea, let me explain who, what Caesarea is. Caesarea is in Israel, but it's, where the, it's the Roman capital of Israel. It's along the coast. It's not deep into the city. So when the people sell over from Rome, it's the first port you come to and you just want to stop. It's, Jews don't want to live in Caesarea. That's, that's the headquarters. So Jews don't even go, want to go to Caesarea. That's where the people who take your money and they tax you live. Remember, during the time of Bible times in Jesus, what it was is Israel was under Roman occupation. So Rome managed their land. They let them practice all their little rules or their religious rules and everything, but the Jews had to pay taxes to Rome, to Caesar. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. Centurion means he was a leader. He had 100 soldiers under him. The Italian regiment meant there he was connected to Rome and he had a, a certain maybe elite group of soldiers with him. He was a devout man and a fear of God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. About three in the afternoon, a lot of things happen at three in the afternoon. About three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw a vision of an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius! Staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord? So God is speaking now to Cornelius. The angel told him, Your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa. Joppa is 31 miles south. Joppa is a Jewish town. In fact, Jonah in the well occurred in Joppa. It, so there, this is a city along the coast, 31 miles south. So you would just travel along the beach there, travel along the beach road, and just you would end up in Joppa. So that's where Peter is going to be at. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who's also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon. You know, in Bible times, everybody had the same name. You had two names, so everybody's just named Simon. He's lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. So there's a Simon Peter is saying with Simon the Tanner. Tanner meant he made leather and he lived in a house by the sea. That's, that's their address. I guess that's how you find stuff. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So he's sending these three men, two household servants, one of the soldiers, because he's got a hundred under him, he says, it's time to go to Joppa, and you're going to go find some people, a man named Simon Peter, and bring him up here to me. So that's all he knows. He doesn't know anything else at this point. This is a, somebody who's not Jewish, who is realizing that we are going to, uh, this is going to break some social, uh, nor, social rules right here. So look at Peter. Now God is preparing Peter. The next day as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. 
he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. So Peter's going to have a vision. He saw heaven opened in an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lower by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and birds of the sky. So Peter is he's hungry. It's noon. It's lunchtime. He's on the roof spending time in prayer. And all of a sudden he has a vision. And he looks up and here comes this sheet. A sheet's coming down with unclean animals. All these animals, birds, reptiles, and four-footed, four-clothed animals are just stuff that Peter would never eat. And it's coming down and the, it says in verse 13, a voice said to Peter, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Well, that's not kosher food. That, you would never eat a turkey. You would never eat a pig. And Peter says, no, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything impure and richly unclean. Peter's saying, Lord, I, don't, I would never do such. This stuff breaks the book of Leviticus. This breaks the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Exodus. We have kosher, clean, and unclean food that we're supposed to be eating. So, it goes on to say here, verse 15, again a second time the voice said to him, what God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened, look at this, three times. Three times this occurred. Many times with Peter, uh, Peter had one of these. Have you ever heard somebody say he has an independent spirit? What that means is they're stubborn. That's what an independent spirit is. Uh, that means you have to beat somebody over the head three times to get them to do the right thing. Well, with Peter, you know, he told Jesus he was not going to deny him. Three times the rooster crowed. Uh, he, right there, he denied Jesus. Not only that, um, when Peter had to be reinstated eating breakfast along the Sea of Galilee, three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Do you really love me? Three times he's having to go through this. So here three times this sheet is going to come down and says, why don't you go? I know you're hungry. Why don't you go ahead and eat some food? And over and over again, Peter kept saying, no, I'm not going to eat it. I'd rather starve to death than eat unclean food. And this happened three times, and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. So all of a sudden, bam, it goes away. So Peter's up on top of this roof at this friend's house in Joppa by the sea, and he's like, what is going on? I just had the wildest vision of eating unclean food. That made no sense to him to, to do that. That would not be appropriate. So now, remember too, we're about to have, this is how the Lord brings unlikely people into your life. Cornelius had a vision, and he's sending people down to talk to Peter. Peter just had this vision of unclean food. So you can see something is about to occur. While Peter was deep, verse 17, while Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen mean, right away the men who had been sent by Cornelius Having asked directions to Simon's house, remember they show up in and they don't even know where they're going. So they're like, where is Simon the Tanner at? We don't even know who we're looking for. So they're having, they show up in Joppa and start asking questions. And notice it says they stood at the gate. Do you know why they had to stand at the gate? Because it was a Jewish house. They were Gentiles. Gentiles would not be welcome to even go into the gate. So they're standing at a gate and they're yelling, trying to get people's attention. You wouldn't allow. Allowing somebody into your home means you accept them and what they believe. Back in Bible times. It says they're standing at the gate, these three Gentiles. They called out asking if Simon, who is also named Peter, was lodging there. And so look at verse 19. Back to Peter. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him. So he's just sitting here thinking, I don't know what I just saw, but I, I don't know, Lord. I just, I'm, I'm not going to go break the Bible and start eating un reptiles, unclean food. And Peter's thinking about this. He's still hungry. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them. Look at this. 
with no doubts at all. That phrase, with no doubts at all. God is having to tell Peter. He says, Peter, I know you're not going to feel comfortable doing this. This is completely out of your area. So you do not need to have any doubts. Have, you just need to trust me in this. Because I have sent them. I've sent these people to you. And it goes on to say, Then Peter went down to the men and says, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is your reason you're here? So Peter goes down and greets them. They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. This was probably the very first time in Peter's life he invited a Gentile into his house and he allowed them to stay there. Three Gentiles came into Peter's house, or at least to Simon the Tanner's house. So this was a big move for Peter. He's all of a sudden now welcoming a Gentile into his home. And it goes on to say here, the next day he got up and set out with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. So some other believers are going with Peter. And they're going up to Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him. So Peter shows up at Caesarea. Cornelius has been looking forward to this meeting. He's got all his family around. Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. So remember, Cornelius is a Gentile. All he knows is he had this vision. This angel came to him and said, go find Peter. So when Peter walks in, he starts worshipping. Anytime we see someone worship another man in the Bible, they're always corrected and rebuked. And Peter's going to do that here. We're told on the first commandment, we're only to worship the Lord. We don't bow down to any other people. We don't bow down to statues or objects. We're not to do that. We only worship Jesus. In fact, in our judgment, the Bible says every knee will bow towards Jesus, towards the Lord. So right off the bat, Cornelius is confused. He doesn't know. He thinks he's to worship Peter. So he begins to bow down. But Peter, look at this, lifts him up and says, stand up, for I myself am also a man. And Peter says, hey, buddy, I'm just like you. We're just human. Look, God spoke to me. He spoke to you. You don't need to worship me. I'm, you stand up. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. So Cornelius had brought the whole town around. Peter said to them, you know, now notice here, Peter right off the bat recognizes he has entered into a Gentile home, which is wrong for him to do. That's not wrong according to the Bible. It's wrong to according him to Jewish tradition. It's a difference for, it's a tradition like we deal, deal with the traditions. So it says here, Peter says, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. He right off the bat recognizes, I don't belong here. I'm not supposed to be coming into a foreigner's home. But God has told me that I'm to be here. So I don't really know what's going to happen. Everybody's anticipating something is about to happen because God has orchestrated this meeting. Just like in mine and your life, God brings unlikely people that meet, you will meet in an unlikely place in, in, for the purpose of people getting saved. I remember a few years ago, I, we had family Christmas pictures. Well, you know, I go on stuff like that, I'm literally thinking, how much of, I'm going to have to write a check. I mean, it's just like to bring the checkbook. I mean, it's just, you're thinking, how much is it going to cost? That's what I'm thinking as I go picture day. We show up, and we get there, and I'm thinking, I don't really want to be here. This is just a waste of money. Uh, we can take pictures for free on the phone anywhere. But do you know, <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, God had other plans. The photographer got saved. I led her to Christ because the Lord was preparing this. She found out basically I was a pastor and that God was, she had a bunch of questions, spiritual questions. She didn't care at all to talk about taking pictures. She wanted to talk about the Lord. But the Lord had been preparing her for that meeting. I, this is how the Lord works in her life. I don't even want to go. 
I have no desire. I'm thinking, how much is it going to be? The, Lord, the Lord's totally preparing her. She's just thinking it's another day of Christmas photos with some family I don't know. And then the Lord does a great miracle in their life. That's how God works. That's what's going on here. And He does the same in your life. As we just are thinking, I'm just going through my routine, daily, boring life, Monday through Friday, and get two days on the weekend. Look at what's happening here. Peter's recognizing, I shouldn't even be. First of all, I don't even go to Caesarea. This is like the Las Vegas of Israel. All you people are unclean. I don't even eat your type of food. I don't even like y'all people anyway. All y'all do is take our money from us. I don't even know why I'm here to begin with. I mean, that's what he's thinking. And you think about that in the context of your life. Some of you, you're here in Lexington. You don't even want to be in this city. You don't even want to be in this state. You might want to be in this church this morning. And you're just like, why am I here? And that's probably what Peter's thinking. And the Lord leads us in these type of situations for a great purpose. And we're about to see that purpose here. Nobody knows, but probably knowing Peter, because he's witnessed these events before, he knows what God is up to something. God is going to do something at this point. None of this is by accident. So, he's reminding them that he's not even supposed to be in your home. And I don't want to associate with you people, you foreigners anyway. Uh, you know, I think about <laughs> verse 28. He calls them foreigners. I mean, think about it. What if, I mean, you, you turn on the news today. It's all about illegal immigration. 15 million illegals have poured into our nation. That's all I hear when I turn on the news. What if I invited some of you all saying, hey, there's a home full of illegals that have invited us here in Lexington. And we need to go over there because they want us to meet them. Some of you would look at, and I would be the same way, go go to their house and and talk to them. We don't need to go talk to them. They need to go back to Mexico. They're not supposed to be here to begin with. That's probably what Peter's thinking about. Where the Lord wants us to go there, not to send them back to Mexico, but to tell them about Jesus. He called these people foreigners. He's thinking, you don't even belong here, Cornelius, this is Rome. Your your country. You blo- you lead the Italian regiment. If you're leading the Italian regiment, go back to Italy. You don't need to be here in Caesarea, Israel. But that's what's going on. You do you see this? Do you see all the cultural issues going on here? And what's happened? Peter calls them foreigners. I mean, y- y'all don't belong here to begin with. But this is what the Lord wants me to do. And he goes on to say. He says, God's told, told me I'm not to be uh, calling you people impure or unclean, so tell me, why have you sent me? So look at what happens here. Cornelius replies. This is the whole movement of the Holy Spirit. Four days ago, at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then a man in dazzling clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius. Your prayer has been heard, and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good for you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. You could not set up a better situation than that. Cornelius has no clue what Peter's about to say. The whole town's there waiting around. They're anticipating something's going to happen. Peter, he's in a foreigner's home. He kept telling them over and over again, I don't belong in your house. I don't eat your food. I don't even like you people. I don't even want to be here. It's like, hey, how many times do I have to put you down before I preach a sermon? That's literally what he's doing to these people. Y'all don't belong here. You need to go back to your country. Go back to that Italian regiment. Peter's walking in and says, if the Lord hadn't told me to be here, there's a 0% chance I would ever even walk into your house. I mean, do you just see, and poor Cornelius like, I just had this vision. The angel came and told me. And then, we're not going to read the rest of it. I'm going to just tell you what's going to happen. Peter preaches Jesus. That's what he just did. The Holy Spirit comes down. The whole group's saved. People are getting saved left and right, and they're getting baptized. They became saved followers and believers of Jesus. And this was a mass movement of the Holy Spirit among Gentiles. 
And then what's amazing at this point, right here in Caesarea, and I would bet, I have imagined, looking at our crowd, we probably don't have a lot, not that I can pick them out, not a lot of Jewish people here today. So probably most of us are Gentiles. We're a recipient of this revival here in Caesarea, of what happened with Peter preaching to Cornelius about Christ. It just started spreading, and it spread all the way here to today, us as believers in Christ. So the whole point of this story is these are two unlikely people who have a radically different background, who don't even like each other, who would never even associate or cross paths with each other. Yet God in His providence, He brought them together because they would have never met together on their own. Only the Lord had to bring them together. And in that, all these people get saved. And the point of this story is for us to say, go back to that question, am I going through life, am I relying upon myself rather than God? Because Peter... He wanted to follow his Old Testament kosher laws. He never wanted to enter a Gentile's home. So right there, those two rules would break him or forbid him from ever even going and speaking to Cornelius. Cornelius wanted to stay collecting taxes and leading his little 100-man army there in Caesarea. He would never even want to travel to other parts of Israel. His job is just make sure other countries don't attack him and go kill people if they do. That's all he wants to do. He's a warrior. So you see, these two people have nothing in common, yet their greatest need was that they all needed Jesus. And what happens to us when we pass away, and we will, we give an account to the Lord. When the Lord looks at us, He's going to say, okay, have you received my Son Christ as your Savior? Are your sins forgiven? Have you trusted in Christ? That is what we are judged by. Not by any other worldly things out there. We need to have an awareness from this message here. A life that relies upon the Lord is one where we wake up and say, God, today instead of just me viewing this day, this week, Going next week, college, next week, college football is going to start. Uh, September is going to be here soon. It's going to, a brand new season's right around the corner. A lot of new things will be happening. And instead of just relying upon what we're accustomed and used to, we live a life that says, Lord, I want you to bring people, unlikely people, people who I would never cross paths with into my life so I can recognize it's not for me to put them down or to justify myself or think about how great I am. It's for me to talk to them about Jesus. Do you ever pray, says Lord, bring unlikely people into my life, people I have nothing in common with, people I might not speak the same language of them, with nothing, no, not, nothing similar in our background, but I know they need the Lord. That should be what it means, what it looks like, a picture of our life that's completely relying upon God instead of what we customarily know. One of our greatest dangers is we go through life like Peter and we just do what we're familiar with. We all do. I'm the same way. You just live in this life, says, I'm accustomed to this, I'm used to this. I, this is what I dress like. These are the people I associate with. This is what I look like. I'm just going to be friends with these people. And what happens, we run people through a friend filter and say, only these people I'm going to talk to. The problem when we do that is we don't get to meet Cornelius. God's going to bring people like Cornelius in our life so we can have this same type of experience of a great movement of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons you might not be experiencing the Holy Spirit is because you're thinking like Peter here. Peter was arguing with the Lord. Oh, I'm not going to that man's house. That's unclean. That's a Gentile. Oh, I'm not going to eat that type of food. That breaks Leviticus chapter 17. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I've never even touched a turkey. I mean, it's just he just justifies himself about how righteous he is. God takes our lives, and He wants to show us. You know, one last thing, the last verse I'm going to share with you. In... Um, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 19, about this clean and unclean food. Peter thought food that was unclean was non-kosher food. Jesus came along and he said, 
You know, what makes you unclean is not the food you eat. It what comes out of a person, not what goes into a person. So if you have a person in Mark 7, 19, 7, 20, that's going around saying, you know what, I've been able to eat all this clean food, but then they're going around lying, they cuss people out, they put people down, they make inappropriate comments, what comes out of their mouth is what makes them unclean. That's what Jesus says. So Jesus said, I'm doing away with all this unclean food stuff. I want to look at what comes out of you, not what goes into you. And this morning I ask you, just like Cornelius, Cornelius had a receptive heart. He obeyed the Lord and he responded to what, to what Peter said. Peter, he had to be prodded here and prepared for this meeting. He had a lot of barriers he had to overcome. But in God's great unity here he brought these two together and when we are when we are convicted by the holy spirit when god speaks to us when god puts someone in our path when god points out sin to us folks our only appropriate response is to say lord if you said it's not clean then i'm not going to call something unclean that you have said that's clean jesus wants us to view other people as their greatest need, which is our greatest need as well, is that of need of being saved. Someone is saved or they're not saved. They're going to heaven or they're going to hell. Folks, that is it. That is the standard. That When we stand before the Lord, our voting record, our citizenship, how much money we've made, how good of savers or spenders we are, Whatever else we've done, it's either we're saved or we're not saved. And that is what the Lord was leading these to. So the Holy Spirit came down because God's business is the salvation business. You know, in our church, a couple of weeks, we're kicking off this 40 days of outreach, which is ultimately leading up to our fall revival in October. And I want you to be praying these next couple of months. Say, God, why don't you bring someone in my path Someone, an unlikely person, someone who's different than me, that you help me share the gospel with, that you help me tell them about the Lord, that you help me be a witness or invite them to church or to Sunday school and help speak up for what their greatest need is. You start praying that prayer, and I promise you, God will be, begin b- bringing Cornelius's in your life. Be trying to invite you in the band. Y'all come on down. We're going to have our invitation. We're going to respond to the gospel. Some of you here need to get saved. Cornelius and his whole house got saved and baptized. Now listen, if Cornelius can do it, and he was a Gentile, and he was in Caesarea, and he was unclean. He met all these qualifications. He ate non-kosher food. So Peter will look at somebody like him and says, oh, he just, he just misses the mark. If Cornelius can get saved in his whole house, we, you can get saved as well. This is also our time we join our church. If you want to join Broadway Baptist Church and unite as our church family, this is the time you walk forward, take mine or Zach's hand, and we present you and we uh, and make you part of our faith family. So we're going to stand together. Beach and our wonderful band is going to lead us in our song. I stand out front. Zach Bauer stands up here with me. We respond to the Lord this morning. And the angels cry and holy all creation cries and holy you are lifted high and holy and holy forever. Hear your people sing and holy to the King of Kings and holy you will always be and holy and holy forever.
And your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, and holy forever. Hear your people sing. Holy to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy, holy city and our neighborhood. 